Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar from Publication to the Public, Expanding Your Research Beyond Academia with, editors, with editor of the Conversation US, Maria Belinska. My name is Camille Gamboa, and I am the PR, Public Affairs, and Conventions Manager at Sage Publishing. If you have any questions with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen, and one of our helpful team members will get back to you ASAP. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for Q&A from, from you all, so please also use the Q&A box to ask any questions to Maria throughout the webinar. Please take note of the webinar hashtag, hashtag Sage Talks, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments there. All right, let me begin by introducing you to our speaker. Maria Belinska is the editor of The Conversation US, an independent nonprofit media organization that publishes news analysis and commentary written by academics and edited by journalists aimed at the general public. She was previously at the BBC London in London, where for 10 years she was editor of World Current Affairs Radio. A 2010 Neiman Fellow at Harvard, she is also the founder of Latitude News, a digital platform for local global mashup journalism. She is also the author of The Bagel, The Surprising History of a Modest Bread, published by Yale University Press. This one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing, and we will be sending out a link for viewing and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. Now, without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Maria. Thank you so much, Camille, and thank you to Sage for inviting me to do this um, to this webinar. I'm really pleased there's so much interest in this topic, and as Camille says, Please do um, interrupt with questions during the webinar. We're going to have time at the end for Q&A, but if you have any questions as we're going through the slides, please don't hesitate to ask them. Um, so as uh, Camille said, a bit on to the next slide. Um, Camille's helping me with the slides here. Um, right now I'm at the conversation, which is explicitly about um, bridging the gap between academia academia and the general public through journalism and we're going to talk about that a little more later but I just wanted to say um, Camille if you could go to the next slide um, that um, uh, what I've worked with many academics in my previous life um, at the BBC and not just um, as interviewees um, we've tackled subjects such, such as the history of anthropology through um, a documentary series um, I've um, produced radio talks with economists, historians, and philosophers, and also worked on what you might argue is the granddaddy of all um, uh, sort of bridging the gap between academia and public um, programs, the Reef Lectures that started in 1948 with the philosopher um, Bertrand Russell. Um, so all of this to say that I'm a strong believer in the value that academics can add to the public debate and, uh, you know, really um, excited that the, uh, all of you are listening to this um, to, to talk about it. So, um, why, so a little, um, I've said a little bit about me, so, you know, we realize at the conversation that the um, debate around whether um, academics should get involved in public discussions is, is quite a live one. And I wanted to share with you um, some of the interesting um, uh, statements that have been made by academic leaders in the United States on this topic. Um, the first slide is um, a quote from uh, Mark Schlissel, who is the uh, president of University of Michigan. Um, and this was, um, what, what, what is interesting to me about this quote and the next one is that they put the, um, the, 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 the participation of academics um, in the public arena almost in uh, moral terms. As you can see, this was um, President Schlissel speaking at a conference in May last year. Um, which was entitled Academic Engagement in Public and Political Discourse. Um, and he talked about responsibility and obligation to engage in public discourse and to share the expertise that we accumulate. Um, the next slide um, has a quote from uh, President of um, University of California system, Janet Napolitano. 
Um, and this is in an article that she wrote for um, The Conversation. Um, and Camille, if you could go to that next slide, um, where she talks about um, that the fact that it's incumbent on um, on academics to uh, take part in the public debate, and and certainly, you know, um, from the public's perspective, I think there's no doubt that um, the the that having the experts talk about what they know about um, on the big issues of the day is incredible. Is is not just enriching; it's really important in order to inject fact and context into the debate. I mean, if you look at um, journalist research, a lot of what people say they're missing is the context and the explanation and understanding in the journalism um, that's around. And therefore, your participation and sort of your engagement um, on, and, on, in different media platforms is um, something that really is appreciated by people. Um, another point to make is that um, so because so many of you are actually looking not just at problems, but about how problems can be solved, this is something that's also very much in um, short supply, could be argued in journalism, because uh, you know there's the old journalistic expression, when it bleeds, it leads. Um, but the, uh, again, interestingly, research, um, uh, audience research around journalism shows that uh, People are interested in seeing what can be done about the problems that we have, what can be done about climate change, what can be done about prison reform, what can be done about our electoral system, for example. Um, so again, a really vital role for you to play. Um, obviously, um, and I, I have a feeling my, uh, my slides, I may be seeing the slides a bit later than you all, I hope not, but the, um, the other, uh, the other uh, fact is that when you do get involved in um, this kind of, uh, of sort of pu public um, public debate, your personal profile, of course, will will rise, um, and your network will expand. And sometimes in in unexpected ways. I mean, one of the things that we find fascinating at the conversation is how articles on the conversation um, enable um, our contributors to make connections with other academics, but not necessarily in their field of discipline, in other disciplines. And this has led to really enriching conversations. Um, more widely, uh, sometimes one can even sort of connect with somebody who might be related to your research. Um, as it happened in one case that where we had a postdoc doing medical research on the link between diet and resilience of cells, and somebody who read um, his article actually was following the diet that he um, he described, and they are now in contact. So things can really expand in ways that you can't predict and can be, um, I think, very enriching. So all, all good reasons to um, engage. So how to do Mario, it? Um, yes. Hi, we've just got one question, so I'm just going to interrupt you here. Oh, good. Um, so we have one um, participant asking, how does participation in the public debate relate to what we discussed as impact? and wider context beyond academia. So what are the impact gains? Maybe you could provide an example of, of that, or maybe that's to come. Um, well, the impact gains um, I would see as, first of all, people having access to information that they didn't necessarily have access to, which in turn um, affects their thinking. This can be, of course, from the level of simply, you know, uh, people discussing this in, um, you know, at the workplace or at home, but there are also, um, obviously, when you're engaging um, in this way, let's say on the, uh, you, in, and you have an article um, in the New York Times or the Washington Post, or you are interviewed um, on NPR, uh, chances are that policymakers um, are also going to be hearing what you have to say, and this can directly affect their their thinking. Um, so I, I think that these, you know, these are sometimes hard to measure, um, but certainly um, th there, one can see that, uh, you know, anecdotally we hear of, you know, people who uh, read something, who hear something, 
uh, who are in a position to make decisions, they, they, they follow up the person, you know, the expert, the academic expert who has contributed this research or, or, or information or scholarship and actually enlist their, you know, advice um, in going forward. So, shall we go to the next slide? Um, so the next slide is uh, about um, pitching, and um, really, um, what uh, you know here is the, the critical thing is you, <laughs> that to some degree you need to do a bit of work in in getting into um, the editor's or journalist's shoes, um, and you know as you'll see the the, the questions there uh, might appear a little simplistic, but they're absolutely um, essential because um, the the person who is at a given publication or um, broadcasting organization, you know, has a limited time and limited space for material, and therefore they need to be thinking um, with they, they they need to be thinking what um, it, it is that's going to be of value to their listeners or readers, um, and in particular, uh, you know, the, the critical question is why should um, their readers or listeners care about this subject? Um, can, uh, Camille, can you um, hear me? There seems to be some problems with the audio conference. Yes, yep, yeah, uh, you, we can hear you. I think um, a few individual might, users might have some problems, but I think we're okay. Okay, so um, why is it so so what we are always asking what is very helpful to any editor to any commissioner of material is you know what is the relevance of your research to um, the ordinary person or is there some surprise that's going to come about this this is a wonderful way of engaging people it's sort of um, something that will be uh, counterintuitive um, to what they consider to be the norm. Um, why now? Again, uh, inevitably, as journalists, one of the things we're always looking for are, uh, is content that relates to um, the debate at the present moment in the news agenda, um, or to, I mean, anniversaries are always also um, a great way of um, uh, having a peg to, to connect with people. Um, and finally, you know, the question is, you know, why, why you, the editor, will also want to know what, you know, what is it about sort of your expertise is going to um, be, you know, why is it that you, of all people, should be um, writing or contributing on this subject? And again, these are not, as you can see, these are very sort of straightforward questions um, and that simply require you to, to sit stand in our shoes for a little bit. So um, on to the next slide now. Um, and uh, what I wanted to, sh to show you was the kinds of, again, this, this will help sort of inform your thinking about how your piece could work. Um, the, generally, you know, this is, a, this is not an exhaustive list of the kinds of stories that you might do, but it just gives you, a, it, it, it's pretty comprehensive and it gives you an idea of how to think about them. So on the one hand, the news analysis piece, as we like to refer to it, is something that is prompted by what is happening um, in the news at the moment. So to give you an example, um, we know that um, in Brazil, uh, there's probably going to be another impeachment vote um, against the president um, in the Senate, and this is a great opportunity uh, for a, a piece that would look at either um, the recent political history of Brazil, why this is happening, or at the eco um, economy of Brazil and how this is going to all this political this political crisis is affecting the economy and vice versa. Um, and people are going to be more interested in that kind of research, contextual research, because of the story being big in the media. Obviously, there's also research that's not pegged to any um, news item, but simply, you know, you're, you've done some research that is about to be published in a peer-reviewed journal, and um, you're interested in getting the public engaged with it. Um, that's that's 
that's a terrific, um, you know, uh, sort of it, it, um, peg in and of itself. And simply there, then, it's a question of explaining to a given editor, you know, why this research um, is important and, and how it could be, you know, exploring with them how it could be made relevant to the general reader. The explainer of the topical issue is an interesting one because, and I'm going to give you examples of all of these things in a minute, but because sometimes there are things that you might consider to be um, really straightforward and you know inside out because of your work, but actually it's the kind of sort of basic context that um, the, the, the ordinary citizen does not know and actually would really appreciate. And I have to say at the conversation, some of our best read pieces are precisely these, where um, there is something in the news that, uh, no, that, they, that um, people are talking about, but nobody has really explained how, it, how a particular process works. Um, and an academic comes along and explains it, and people really, um, you know, really appreciate that. Um, and then the final one I wanted to mention was this personal story behind the headline because this can be something, this can be a narrative, it can be, and I know that sometimes there's a reluctance to talk about one's own story in terms of how it, it's intertwined with your research, but actually people, the general reader responds incredibly well to this kind of um, approach uh, because it's a story, I mean, because it gives them this kind of uh, personal insight into how research is done. So if we can go to the examples now. Um, can, the I, first, can I just, yes. can I interrupt you with another question? Sure. Great. Um, so kind of going back to the idea of pitching, um, one um, viewer asks how to get out of your head so um, she brings up a great point. Um, you may believe you have something that is relevant and has leverage, but what are some other questions to ask yourself prior to selling the pitch? I think, I think you know, when we're writing things, sometimes we forget about, you know, what the other perspective might be. So how do you get out of your head? Yeah. Well, I mean, my favorite way of doing that is, if you, is actually to imagine that you've got in front of you a high school student. And you're sitting down and you're having a, you know, coffee or whatever it is um, with them and they say, well, what do you do? And how, how are you going to start telling them that? I, I think that imagining another individual and not a, not, because when you imagine readership, that's, um, that's actually very abstract, but imagining, or it could be, it could be a high school student. Um, it could be actually somebody you know. Um, it could be uh, one person said to me that they imagined their grandmother. <laughs> um, but it was, it, it, because that helps you start to think in a different way. And then you can sort of put yourself in their shoes and say, okay, well, why are they going to care about this, this topic? Um, and, and, and how am I, you know, what kind of language might I use to explain it to them. Some of the things that we do quite a lot here is particularly on the science desk, think about how we can use um, visual language to explain sometimes, um, you know, quite uh, complex topics. Um, but, but having that person in front of you, I think does that, that's one exercise that can help. Great, thank you. Okay, so on to the next slide, which is um, an example of, uh, yes, a, this, is, this is an example of a, a pitch that is a news analysis. It's, as you can see, in response to um, the rhetoric of Donald Trump. Um, and, um, you know, immediately, uh, well, she, she, this professor at Texas A&M had written for us before. Um, so she had introduced herself that way. This is, by the way, I should explain, um, if you do end up pitching to the conversation, we have a pitch box, and this is, um, we, we prompt you to write a, a short pitch um, and then also give your, um, give your, obviously, your bio on the right-hand side, as you can see, and then uh, outline what your research areas are. So she, you know, she immediately, um, places it in the context of the campaign. 
um, talks about um, how um, you know she's going to be looking at this particular device in rhetoric, paralipsis, um, but you know underlines she's going to be using lots of examples, which of course again for the lay reader is really important, the illustrations, um, and then says why she thinks it's an important piece because because it's part of his fundamental rhetoric strat rhetorical strategy, and because it's allowing him to go into places that other um, candidates have not. Um, so so that's one. Uh, so that's the sort of news analysis pitch. If we could go to the next slide, it's about um, this is about um, sort of uh, recently released research. Um, this is from uh, Professor uh, Pippa Norris, who shares her time between Harvard and University of Sydney, and she got in touch because the results from the project that she runs, the Electoral Integrity Project, um, had just come out looking at um, you know how elections are run around the world. And again, I mean, she she gave the context of uh, why this is important because there are flawed. Um, and failed elections um, around the world, with a few examples. Um, she placed it, you know, in in it. She made the timeline quite clear that this was new research, um, and she t she explained how um, you know how this research had been done. Um, and you know, then she talked about how she wanted to talk about both the positive and negative cases around the world. As it happened, when we got in touch with her, she actually suggested doing two pieces. One was more of a, a general piece looking at um, uh, sort of poverty and elections, and the other was looking specifically at American elections. And um, uh, and of course, uh, again given the campaign that's taking place right now, given the fact that the conversation U.S. is aimed at an American audience, we were keen in both stories. But again, she lays out very clearly what the research is and why it's important. Um, the next um, slide, I wanted to um, highlight the fact that this was um, research that had been done um, by um, a uh, scholar at Georgia State University Law School on police shootings in Chicago, um, and he had done this research um, independently of uh, obviously um, the, the news agenda. But when um, it when it was announced that the uh, city was going to be looking into one particular case of a police shooting, that was when we sort of we we were able to really uh, work with this scholar, put his research out, and immediately it was this this piece was um, you know widely read and republished by the New Republic and the Business Insider. So you know this is we call it the art of the news peg because sometimes it's a question, you know, sometimes there's something in the news agenda that's an obvious peg, but sometimes it's a question of um, sort of waiting for that news peg to happen because you know um, in this case unfortunately you, you, it, it, there was a there was a likelihood it might happen um, and in this case the editor at, at the conversation and um, Nirej worked together to um, to get the piece out so that it was still relevant when the general media was talking about Chicago and the mayor of Chicago looking into this um, incident. Um, I talked. The next slide, please, is about the explainer, and this was um, in the wake of um, uh, Justice Antonin Scalia's death. And you know, again, this obviously for a law professor, you know, four steps to appointing a Supreme Court justice is pretty obvious stuff. But actually, this isn't necessarily. Um, Available in the media. I mean, one would have to make an effort to look it up. And and she, uh, again, a um, scholar at uh, Georgia State uh, Law School, did a wonderful job of you know clearly um, and engagingly explaining how how this happens. Um, and this was again you know very well read, um, and it, was, it, it generated a lot of interest. Um, I wanted to show you the next piece because it just shows you. Um, uh, maybe the 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 participant who asked the question of getting outside your own head. I just wanted to contrast the title of the uh, paper that came out. Um, Berkeley's Alan Auerbach and BU's Lawrence Kotlikoff. That you know they had this paper. Uh, as you, you can see the title. Um, 
uh, in an economics peer-reviewed journal, um, and here was the title that we ended up with in the conversation. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, and it just can show, it, it, it is possible to do this kind of, you, you can call it possibly trans, translational work. Um, it is possible to do, and I'm, I'd like to add, it is possible to do without dumbing down. I think that's really important to, important point to make. Um, and final, the final example I wanted to give on the next slide is the personal story. Um, this was a wonderful story um, by uh, uh, the one of the scientists who'd been on the um, uh, New Horizons team, um, and I, I just thought I'd re you can read um, the, the the first paragraph. Paragraph there, um, but it is you know you read that first paragraph um, and um, it's immediately exciting. It's immediately engaging. Um, you know he he sets it up. Um, I just read the first, last three sentences. New Horizons would be the first close up at a world that we've known about only distantly for 70 years. That kind of challenge is hard to pass up, and I didn't. It's immediately so he's he's. He's he's creating a lot of excitement and sort of um, setting something up to the, the list that the reader is going to, you know, you want to read further. Um, so that kind, it, it's not always possible to do this kind of story, but sometimes it is, and it's well worth considering um, because it really uh, people love it. Um, and again, you know, this this piece. Um, was very widely read and 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 uh, republished in Quartz and in Newsweek. So, um, these are sort of a few examples of the types of stories. I, I wanted to then go on to really um, think about the 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 actual writing and 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 this was you know actually as you can see this is a wonderful beginning of a piece. Um, it makes you want to continue to read, and that's exactly what you always want to do because. As I'm sure you all know, it is people's time is at a premium, and um, really at the top of any piece, whether it be an audio piece, a television piece, or an article, is absolutely critical to hook hook um, the readers in. So, you know, starting the article, you know, what to think about um, is. So, if we continue on to the next, I think it has the starting the article, um, Camille. Um, the Yes, so, so, you know, how do you engage the reader? Thinking about your high school student or your grandmother or your best friend who's in a completely, who does something completely different, you know, is there topical relevance? How can, is there something that can be related to their lives? Is there a way of surprising them? Can you tell an anecdote or a story that will get you into your research? That's always a wonderful way. Or indeed a provocative statement. Um, that really sort of takes people, uh, you know, that, that sort of confronts them with something that they didn't know. Or um, All of these things will really help in terms of just engaging people from the get-go. Um, and, in, you know, thinking the top is, is, is so crucial because you have to um, engage them at the top, then make have what we call um if you could get to the next um slide please uh camille the what we call in journalism the nut craft which is really framing the piece what is it you're going to be writing about um you know what is this story about and this sounds really simple but sometimes it actually takes a little bit a little time to to think you know is is there one can you boil down for your lay reader, what is the question that you're going to be exploring? Um, and why does it matter? So, you know, here we have um, a, uh, a little, uh, one example um, that was a nice one in terms of um, research on um, dating, online dating. Um, and obviously, again, these are most people are interested in dating, so I mean it was easy to relate to the um, to the uh, ordinary reader. Um, but you know it's very clearly set out that it, that um, the, the 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 what the dominant themes are, and that um, what this person, the author, was going to be looking at is what is swiping right and 
why that might not be the best way to find your true love. So um, let's go on to the next because we're going to now just look at a few tops that um, play on you know what I spoke about earlier. So um, the first one is why boys need to have conversations about emotional intimacy in the in the classrooms. Um, so if we could go to that next slide, um, if now what we actually uh, so this starts and I hope you can see this plainly um, on your screens. But this is by a sociologist from University of Massachusetts Amherst. And it starts with an anecdote um, that um, it, about a veteran um, uh, award-winning teacher um, at a, uh, in a school in the Bronx, and how um, he was um, basically uh, he 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 was forced to um, he here we go. So that my apologies. I had it. I was unable to see for a minute. So. Um, so they talk, she talks about Tom Porton, an award-winning veteran Bronx High School teacher um, who had to hand in his resignation after colliding with the school's principal. And she explains why. And then she asks a question immediately. You know, what does it say when a teacher who encourages students to discuss non-sexual ways to express love causes controversy? And, and this is the way that she then gets into um, her main um, issue, which is, the uh, you know how uh, the, the research around teenage her research around teenage boys, but you're immediately intrigued because um, because of that storytelling. So storytelling is always a good way to get into a piece. So if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is this is the piece that you saw the um, the pitch for earlier. Um, and the re one of the reasons I wanted to show this was um, that in, this is, of course, uh, the case of um, a written piece, which would be a little bit different for an audio piece or a video piece. But she um, was able to start off again with an, a with a, an anecdote, in this case from from uh, from television, with Stephanopoulos' um, interview. Um, uh, with Donald Trump, um, but she was also able. We could we could use this tweet that Trump talks about, and there's it's, it, this won't be true of every uh, obviously article, but thinking about even how things look visually is a way to um, is, is is about communication. And in this case, immediately you know the the text is broken up by a tweet. It's quite intriguing. Um, and you see, you know, this is direct from Donald Trump, the tweet. So you, you, you know, again, it draws you straight in to the story and then she's able to go into, um, into the background and, and into her research. So then if we, we go to the next one, um, and that, this is about uh, really off the back of the Flint um, uh, lead in water um, crisis. And this is one, this is an example of sort of relating to the ordinary person. So, you know, we have all read about Flint um, and been pretty horrified that people um, were drinking this water. Um, but immediately the, uh, the author says, you know, what you may not realize is that lead exposure is a problem throughout the US. Well, obviously, um, and then he, again, he goes into his research about um, lead exposure across the country. And this is, again, um, certainly I wanted to read after that because that affects me as a reader because I'm an American. So, again, that sort of relatability is, a, is, a, is, a, is always a good way of um, engaging people. Um, so if we go to... Um, the next, yes. Yeah, so the, this is really about language, um, and uh, we talked about the smart senior um, in high school um, avoiding jargon. I mean, a good editor will help you. Uh, the, you know, the, the the point about an editor is that they're your first reader or um, or your first listener, and so they will be there to ask you when something doesn't make sense. Um, 
And uh, um, so this jargon, you know, try to avoid jargon. Short sentences, short paragraphs are always the way to go. And using examples to illustrate your analysis is really critical. Sometimes people feel that by writing for the general public, you just need to write in generalities. Not at all. Um, having the specificity and concreteness really helps people get a hold of what it is that you're, um, you're looking into. So if we could go to the next, um, the one, next slide. One question for you um, about yes. jargon. Um, so one, one um, listener asked if you can distinguish more about, uh, make a distinction more clear more clearly between jargon and language of the research field? Sorry, jargon and? Language of the research field? Yes. Um, yeah, they're the same. I would say they're probably the same. I mean, I think, well, um, you, I mean, obviously, in some cases, you know, there are scientific terms for certain things. We, we completely understand that. Um, I think in that case, very often what we do is we use the scientific term and then we explain it. I think probably jargon has a slightly more negative connotation and it's something that's seen as being maybe an abbreviate, you know, sort of um, an inside baseball type of language, which is slightly different from the specificity of a, of a scientific term. But the problem is that very often a specific scientific term won't be um, won't, won't be understood by the general reader and we need to explain it. So I think that, I think, you know, you're right to make that distinction. But the, the question then is, you know, are there, is there another way of, can you use that word and then describe it? Um, so to help the general reader understand. Okay, thank you. So if, so if we go to the next slide. Um, so the next slide is actually a little bit just to tell you a little bit about the conversation. So all of these, I think that, you know, thinking about your audience, um, thinking about language, thinking about um, uh, why people should care and what it is that, you know, your, your particular area of expertise, how do, you, how do you convey the fact that you um, in particular have something to say about this, that applies, of course, to any media um, endeavor, and whether that be um, written or audio or video. In this case, I just um, wanted to tell you a little bit about the conversation because that's where I'm working now, and we're explicitly interested in bridging that gap between academia and the public. So if we could just go to the next slide. Um, uh, here, um, here is our team, as you can see, very friendly team, but also a very small team uh, so, so far, and we're looking to expand that. But basically, the way we see it is that we can bring the best of two worlds together, the academic world and the journalistic world, because um, our expertise obviously lies in finding those news pegs, in thinking about communication, in thinking about the audience, and your expertise is your in-depth knowledge of your of your discipline and bringing those two together can really create something fabulous. Um, the conversation um, US was launched in October 2014 but it started in Australia in 2011. It's part of an international network that now has editions in Australia, the UK, Africa and France as well as the US. It's independent and nonprofit and it's supported by 10 foundations um, the names of which you will know, like you can find them all on our website, but they include places like Sloan, Gates, Howard Hughes Medical, Robert Wood Johnson, Moore, and so forth, and 19 universities across the country, both public and private. So we have, as I say, it's a small startup team of 10 editors and we'll be expanding just next month, in fact. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, now, what makes the way, what we see as our, you know, as you know, the media market in the United States is incredibly crowded, but what makes us special is that every single contributor is an academic researcher. Therefore, they are, and they are affiliated with an academic institution, and they are talking about their area of expertise. 
and critically, we are not a traditional op-ed. So obviously, I'm sure that a number of you are interested in writing op-eds, and I think that's fantastic because I think you ought to be writing op-eds. As, but what we do, we see slightly differently. We see it as um, explanatory contextual journalism that is, that is highlighting people's research. And so there can be a strong argument, but it's very much based on your research and or that of others. Um, and it's, it's always written by people in their field. So we, we, we know that um, people can write eloquently about subjects that are out of their fields, um, but that's not what we do. So Aria, what we do, would you yes. Mind, would you mind just explaining a little bit further about what an op-ed is? We have a couple questions coming in, and uh, I think that'll help make the distinction between an op-ed and Sure, okay. So I would say, I mean, an op-ed is, I mean, it's quite a, it can, you, it can be quite um, varied, um, but generally speaking, it is something that is an opinion, I mean, it is an opinion piece, and it's called op-ed because, of course, it's on the opposite side from the editorial page in a newspaper. So it can, an, I mean, it, an opinion piece um, can be uh, very much in your area of expertise, um, but it will be, and it will be a lot written along the lines of what we talk, we've been talking about. But as I say, it can also be something that is venturing out of that area of expertise because, um, you know, be, because you have something to say. I mean, people, uh, there is a lot of, um, I would, you know, argue in journalism today, there is a lot of opinion. Um, um, out there uh, to be consumed, um, whether it's sort of pundits on television or uh, in in written in written form, um, and so that I would say that y y you might argue that what we do, because we're very much about um, you know basing ourselves on data and evidence, um, is is sort of a subsection of what you might say of op-ed, but the reason we like to distinguish ourselves in this way is because we want to make it clear it's not just about opinion. Is that, um, does that, yeah, any, think, any, does that do it? Yes, I think that answers the question. And just to clarify, um, is it only professors who can contribute or can they be um, graduate students, PhD candidates, et cetera? They can be um, graduate, they can be anybody from PhD student up. And, and with PhD students, we ask that they write specifically about, you know, they, their doctoral research. Um, and then, um, uh, then sort of professors have a little bit more leeway. They might write about their research and other people's research too. But yes, that's the sort of, that those are the people who are um, qualified to write for us. Um, okay. Yeah. Do they have so to be articles? Do they have they, to be, sorry? They can, does it have to be around are, uh, journal articles or can it be book collaborations as well? It can be um, journal articles, it can be book collaborations, it can be right. separate from that. Research. It can be separate from that too. So, I see. So you see, you see our, um, right here we have these twin editorial aspirations um, and, and they are complementary. So on the one hand, you know, the news analysis piece that we've been, ta that I've mentioned before. So, <clears throat> some, you know, your research is relevant to whatever is being discussed in the news. This, so it doesn't need necessarily to have a journal article coming out. It can just be that, you know, you feel, my goodness, they're not talking about X, and this is what they really need to understand in order to, um, to, to, to get the sort of the, the, the subtlety of this particular issue. That is reason enough for us um, you know, to work with you. Um, setting the public agenda is slightly different because that is all about your new research. And that, that is usually around a journal article or a book. Um, and that there we, you know, we really look to our collaborators to be thinking about, you know, you are our thought leaders and we want to work with um, scholars to really sort of get questions out into the public domain that haven't been asked before and get information out that hasn't been seen before. So these are, two, these are our two 
sort of they're, they're, they're twin track and complementary, but they're rather different. So in the first bucket, as it were, you know, we have political scientists who are using their sort of long um, study of American politics to interpret what's going on on the campaign trail. And that's completely different from, you know, what I mentioned from Pippa Norris, which was based on her research of the um, Electoral Integrity Project and, um, you know, actually presenting that research to a wider public. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, the, the, I, I mentioned it's a collaborative editorial process and this is the thing that I think makes this rather special because you can see here, this is in the back end of, end of our content management system. Any article that we get, we upload into our content management system and both the author and the editor can have access at any time and at the same time to edit um, the piece. Uh, it, we tend to speak, as it were, to our authors in, in the body of um, the, the article with questions to them that we put into bold. Um, but the key thing to uh, remember is, and this will be um, sort of underlined at the end of this presentation again, but nothing gets published um, without um, the author being okay with the final copy, the final headline, the final use of, um, of pictures. But I think that what's critical about this is that we're really working together on this, and this is about um, us bringing this sort of new sense and communication skills to the table, um, but in but in your corner, it's about our authors' voices. It is not about the voice of the conversation. We are we see ourselves very much as you know sort of help working with you to amplify your voice so that it can get into that more um, in, in, into the general uh, arena. So if we go to the next slide. Um, which is about, yes, these ease, this is again sort of giving you a little glimpse of the back end of our content management system. This is in the history mode. We were looking at the edit mode before. And the history mode, um, I personally like very much because if you compare this to marking up a Microsoft uh, Word document where you see, you know, you sort of strike through words and have little, um, bubbles all over the place with your comments. Um, here, every version of the piece is saved. You never lose anything. But what you're looking at in the edit mode is the, the you know, the, the most recent version. So it's not, it, it's a much, to my mind, more user-friendly system of editing than Microsoft Word. So if we continue to the next one, um, this is all about the sort of process. Um, one of the things we feel quite um, strongly at the conversation is that, you know, we want to be transparent about um, where people are coming from and therefore we ask all of our um, authors to disclose whether their research has been funded by particular organizations and, you know, whether there are any relevant affiliations um, that they should mention. We, we think this makes um, our publication stronger and it makes our contributors um, put, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a much sort of um, healthier and stronger um, position to be in to disclose up front um, anything that might be relevant. So on to the next and I think it's really that final, yes, here we are, I was saying that you need to, re we, we, this is what we send to you when the final copy is ready to go. Do you, um, do you approve of this copy? So just to now um, onto the next slide to talk about, you know, somebody asked at the beginning about impact. Um, and this is what the other thing that makes the conversation, I think, special apart from this collaborative editorial process is the life after, after publication. We obviously publish on, uh, on our website. We promote the pieces on social media. We have a daily newsletter that's sent to more than 24,000 subscribers. But we also republish through Creative Commons, which means that any pub other media organization is able to publish for free the pieces that have been published by the conversation as long as they do not change the copy. 
So um, this uh, this immediately, um, you know, allows for uh, reaching a variety of audiences, um, and then we can go on to the next slide. It gives you a sense of that. Um, so these are the audiences to the site. We have over half a million um, visitors, unique visitors a month, but through re republication, we have five million reads. Um, a month. And if we go to the next slide, it just gives you a sense of the kinds of um, publishers that are using our material. And as you can see, I mean, Time, Newsweek, Slate, The Washington Post, Scientific American, Quartz, um, and so on. Over 19,000 sites have republished um, us worldwide. And if you go to the um, next uh, slide you'll have, yes, these, this I think will also just, I think this is sort of a nice um, uh, sort of response to how we started off as to why it's important for the um, academic researcher to take part in the public debate because as you can see, um, the readers really appreciate it. Um, and you know, just this this second quote that I like the idea of a news item being written by a person who actually has some background knowledge of the topic. Um, and again, going to the point that somebody raised about the difference between op-ed and what this contextual explanatory journalism, you know, one of the comments made about the conversation articles is that they are um, very sort of civil in tone because they are again. They're very much fact-based, and when, when there's an opinion, it's labeled as such. Um, so, uh, and people, people in, in the current day and age where there is so much sort of partisan, um, partisan opinion and indeed emotion, having this kind of material is really refreshing. So on in, in the next slide, I think it's the feedback from our contributors, in fact, which I um, hope will be a... Uh, an incentive for you to uh, think about contributing. Um, and again, it really just highlights both the, um, the, the process um, and the, the, the fact that also really uh, we see people who contribute more than once, this is just another skill that you can acquire. And it's doing it with us is a, is a great way to do it because um, because it's a safe place to do it in. And going on from there, um, people very often have gone on to um, up writing for other publications and indeed sometimes um, you know, interviews and so forth. Um, and the, uh, the last uh, quote is really sort of underlining the fact that we are this um, distribution uh, platform as well, getting the um, articles to lots of different um, publication. So um, I realize uh, it is coming to the top of the hour, but this is the end of the, the formal presentation, and I wonder if there are any other um, questions that people might have. Thank you very much, Maria. Yes, we have questions pouring in. Um, so um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and get started with a few of them. We'll see what we can get through. Um, Are you there, Maria? Yes, yes, I am. I am. I am. Something. If you could just repeat that question. Yeah, we heard some music on the line. A little interlude there. Okay. Um, okay. So let's let's get to some of the questions. So we have some researchers um, joining us today who just pitched an op-ed to the New York Times Gray Matter. Uh, of course, they have no idea if it will get if it will get accepted because it just was pitched yesterday. But they're wondering if you can suggest any other outlets that really like uh, to accept op-eds op on science topics. On science topics, oh, well, lots of places. I mean, certainly, um, you know, I think most uh, most mainstream uh, media are interested in um, getting, uh, you know, science explained in a clear and engaging manner. So if you can do that about new research, people are really interested. So I think, you know, you could you go from um, Washington Post. To, New York Times, the, the sort of the big newspapers, um, but also um, to magazines. But I, in order to really advise 
better, I'd need to probably know more about the actual topic. And I'd be happy to do that. You've got my, my email there. I'd be happy to do that. Um, the one thing I would say in a plug for the conversation is if you, you know, whatever gets published with us gets can be republished by places like the Washington Post and Scientific American and so forth. So um, that's something to bear in mind. Thank you. Okay, and how do you handle completely new stories? So things that the media are not aware of and might not go, you know, asking for, but um, how do you handle stories that are just not in the news yet? Yeah. Well, we have quite a few of those, um, particularly I'd say probably in the science area, but also in the social sciences. Um, the, the, the key is there that um, we, you know, we, we talk through with our contributors you know, what would be an interesting hook for a general reader. Um, you know, once the article is written, we actually promote two publications where we think they, you know, given the, the past record of what they've picked up from the conversation, what they'd be interested in. And we pitch it to them in that way. Um, so, you know, it, it really, it, it's, um, it's a question of, you know, that, that all-important hook at the top. It does not, it absolutely does not have to be related to the news, but it just, but, you, but, you know, it does need to have some um, sort of bridge to the ordinary reader or listener or viewer um, so that they're intrigued or they think it's, you know, that they can relate to it in some way. Um, there is always, there's, I would say there's almost always a way of doing that, but it, sometimes it takes a little bit more workshopping. Got it. Thank you very much. Okay, then um, just as far as, you know, the process, do you, for, you know, an editor outside of the conversation, do you approach the editor about your work um, um, before you wrote the, write the piece, after you write the piece, um, what's the process like for pitching? Yeah, I would always um, suggest uh, pitching first um, for, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a great discipline because it forces you in, you know, 100 or 200 words to distill what it is that you um, are proposing and why it's important or relevant, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and why you should be writing it. So, you know, it's, it's, a great, it's a great mental exercise, first of all. Secondly, um, uh, an editor will always appreciate having a pitch rather than a finished product because for him or her, um, a finished product represents, first of all, initially a lot more time needed to be invested to, you know, figure, figure out what the piece is about and so forth. But secondly, if they decide to take it, then it will also probably require more time. Whereas, you know, it, it's basically, uh, the way I look at it is, if you accept that, you know, the, the editor is bringing something to the party, you know, it actually to send them a pitch allows them to, to work with you a bit about thinking, okay, what do what do the readers of the New York Times or the readers of, um, you know, the San Francisco Chronicle or Newsweek, what do they, what will they be interested in? Because that's where they have experience. Uh, and, and so it, it, it really, it, it allows them to um, get involved in that initial sort of framing of the piece. So I would always suggest pitching rather than the finished article. Great, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, just going along with that, one final quick question: um, What's a reasonable word count, though, when you when you do get to writing that that article? Yeah. Well, again, it really depends on the publication because um, you know if you think about you know you might if if you think about the Atlantic Monthly, for example, right? They they very often work with um, academics, and there they'd have a few thousand words. Um, a newspaper uh, article might often, they would want something at 600 words. And then at the conversation, we tend to do, you know, 800, 1,000, 1,100 words. So, it, again, it really, it, it's always, this is a, another reason why one should pitch, because then you get the frame, you know, you get the sort of um, what the wordage from the place that you're pitching to. 
they, they will tell you what it is they're looking for because that might also really um, affect what you want to say because you can't cram everything into a 600 word piece you might decide to sort of have the you know do express the argument in a slightly different way thank you and um, unfortunately that's about all we have time for today um, we want to thank everyone for joining us and a special thank you to our speaker Maria Balinska uh, from the conversation US um, in the coming weeks please be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to view the entire webinar and the slides as well as answers to some of the questions we did not have time for today. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of Sage's efforts to communicate science. So please check out our corporate blog, Sage Connection, which publishes tips, new research findings, and will publish this archive webinar, um, as well as Method Space, our newly relaunched community tool for research methods help, and Social Science Space, a space to explore, share, and shape the big issues facing social scientists. Thank you very much for joining us, and have a great day.